type of questions and other things like that to, you know, beat the system. All right, so this is today's agenda. We're gonna be talking about first uh, general tip, tips and strategies, then reading section tips and strategies, then those for the writing section, and then those for the math. And as usual, we'll be having a Q&A session after the presentation is over. All right, so first, this is just a quick recap on the SAT structure. So on the reading section, you have 52 questions and you have 65 minutes to answer them, which leaves you with about a minute and 15 seconds per reading question. On the writing um, section, you have about 44 questions in 35 minutes, which is less time per question than the reading section. For this one, you have about 47 seconds per question. For the math no calculator one, you have about 20 questions and 25 minutes, which is about the same time per question as the reading section, which is one minute and 15 seconds per math no calculator question. And lastly, for the math calculator allowed section, uh, more, more commonly referred to as the math calculator section, you have 55 questions and you have, no, you have 38 questions, my bad, and you have 55 minutes, which leaves you with about one minute and 26 seconds per math calculator question. So as you can see, the math calculator section has the most seconds per question on the SAT test, and the writing section has the least seconds per question on the test. So I'll just be sharing a quick tip on how to keep time. What I did was I kept my time on the, uh, I set my watch into stopwatch mode and then I kept an eye on the minutes that had passed. And my goal was to keep the minutes that had passed about equal to or less than the question number I was on. So for example, if my timer read five minutes, if my stopwatch read five minutes, I made sure I was on no, question no, five no. of that. All right, so yeah, as I said, um, if, for example, if I wasn't, if my stopwatch in five minutes had passed, I would make sure I was on question five or I was ahead of that. That was for the reading section and the math, no calculator and the math calculator sections. Now for the writing section, since you have less than a minute per question, I made sure I was a bit more ahead than five questions for like five minutes. So say I would make sure I had I was like, um, you know, past six questions for five minutes or something like that. So you'll have to adjust your pace for every individual session like that. But that was like the general um, method of keep, keeping time that I had. <clears throat> All right, so first let's talk about the general tips and strategies for the SAT test. And as a note, we won't be able to cover all of them because there's, as I said, there's a lot of them. So these are just the general ones and some we thought that are more important than others. So keep an eye on the timer. This is the most important thing on the SAT test. Some questions you feel like, oh, I can answer these if I spend an additional few seconds or few minutes on these. But that's a problem because the more time you spend on that one question, the less time you have to answer the rest of the questions. And the, since the SAT has no negative marking, by negative marking, I mean that if you get a question wrong, you don't get a point off. So you can guess, so you're supposed to guess on every single question to maximize your score. So in exams in tests like these, you might wanna you know, budget your time for the rest of the questions too. You don't wanna spend it all on the first 15 or so questions and then rush through the other questions in like five or 10 minutes. So don't get hung up on hard questions and keep an eye on that timer. And take multiple practice tests. Now this is a very important thing on the SAT exam. Oh, I'm sorry about that, on the SAT test. You need to, um, get used to the style of questions on the SAT. That is the most important thing in order to develop your own strategies to you know, um, beat the system, I say, or get better at the SAT test. You need to solve those questions again and again and again and take multiple practice tests to analyze your mistakes and maybe develop new strategies after analyzing your mistakes to answer those questions. Because again, as I said before, finding the most efficient and quickest way to solve a question is the key to success on the SAT. And taking multiple practice tests help you with, helps you with that. Plus your score, you'll also see your score improve if you put in the effort and time. Maintain flow before the test. By this, what I mean is that you need to like be in the flow before the test. So for example, if you take like one or two practice tests per week, the month before the, the, month before the SAT test, you need to continue that up until the SAT test. So you remain in that flow, in that rhythm. If you uh, just, you know, 
a week before the SAT test, you just stop that maybe a week or two before it, you just stop taking practice SATs and that's going to like, you know, uh, it's, that would like, um, how do I say it? That would like cut you out of your flow or something. And that might cause you to get score worse on the actual SAT. So I recommend staying in the rhythm or staying in the flow of taking SATs every week or something, right? Right up until before your test. Also don't burn yourself out preparing for the test. Now, some people will take like three to four practice tests a week for the SAT, and that's just too much at one point. You'll burn yourself out mentally and you'll get too stressed. So just don't do, yeah, don't burn yourself mm -hmm. out. You'll see your score drop in this case if you do too much in a week. And take practice tests on paper. This is pretty important because of preparing for the paper exam. Taking SAT practice tests on paper is very important because then you will, it'll expose you to like, how, um, how do I say this? So just taking it on paper is better because then um, you'll be able to, you know. I guess like know how to like show your work, like showing your work or using the Scantron. If I guess if you have a Scantron to use, if you take a practice test. Yeah, and you also get used to the, you know, the physical sensation of skipping back and forth. And I just find paper tests to be faster than online tests. Because on online tests, as you know, you can open like multiple two PDFs up at the same time and you just focus one on the questions and one on the passage. And you won't be able to do that on the actual SAT. So taking it on paper is just better. All right, so let's move on to specific strategies for the reading section. All right, so the most singular, most important thing I can say for the reading section is do not interpret a single thing. The answer to a reading question will always be stated somewhere in the text. It will be somewhere explicitly in the test. If they did allow in the text, if they did allow interpretation, then there would be multiple correct answers, but then that wouldn't really be good for a multiple choice question test, right? So then they will always state the um, answer for something explicitly somewhere in the text. You will not be required to interpret anything. So that's an important thing to remember. Also, you should skim passages quickly to get a mental map of where certain topics are talked about in them. This allows you to like, you know, return to those sections more quickly when you see a question about them. Annotating is also very important. You should annotate for key ideas, focus shifts, and things like this because the SAT has questions on those in the reading section. You'll have questions about when, like about where does the focus shift or more like what does the focus shift to and stuff like that, and key ideas. What is the main idea of the, this passage? You'll see those a lot. So you need to annotate for those so you can easily find them. And if you've already marked them beforehand, then it's pretty easy to just choose the quick answer on the um, question and then move on. Instead of coming back and then having to determine, oh, what was it again? And then choosing it and then moving on. It's just quicker this way. Also, do not use external knowledge. So say the passage on the SAT is about, you know, DNA or something. And you know, and you know what DNA is like. You know how it is. For example, you know you know how it's made. You know what is used to make it. Make it. So don't use that knowledge on the SAT. Only use what's given in the passage. Do not use any external knowledge because sometimes the stuff given on the SAT is going to be different. And sometimes, um, sometimes the passage won't even have certain things that you know by yourself, which will make you choose a different answer that is wrong because there's no evidence from the passage to support that. So as a, just a reminder, do not use your prior external knowledge if you may have any. Always go to the, back to the passage to answer a question. Yeah, that is very important because you don't want to, you know, uh, misremember a thing. So just going back to the passage to answer a, every question is a good thing, I'd say. But then again, you should um, take multiple practice tests and then see if you can remember the answers. But going back to the passage is advised. All right, if possible, always prepare your own answer before looking at answer choices. Now, this is a good strategy that works on some people. Some people don't find it really useful. Some people find it, find it very useful. And some people like find it moderately useful. So you should try this out for yourself before deciding whether to do it or not. And budget time. Yeah, again, this is a really important thing. You don't want to um, end up skipping some questions that you could have spent more time on or something. So always budget your time. You'll have about one minute and 15 seconds per question on average. So you wanna keep an eye on the timer. 
And the historical passages take the most time, yeah. So the historical passages are usually the most complicated passages on the SAT. They take a lot of time and focus to like, you know, understand and break down. And if there's like a double passage, double historical passage, those are usually the hardest passages you can find on the SAT for a lot of students because double passages. So what I mean by double passages is that sometimes instead of a single passage, they will give you two short passages and then they will ask questions about what does author one feel about what author two says, what is author two stance on what author one says, stuff like that. And that makes it a bit more complicated. They also ask questions for each specific passage, but they also ask big, uh, bigger questions like that. So that makes it pretty complicated and adding historical passages to the mix makes it even harder because historical passages use very, not very, they use pretty outdated language. Like they have long sentences that are sometimes hard for people to understand. They typically also use a lot of semicolons. So you might want to watch out for that. So reading historical passages like that and doing questions for those will help you score better on those. All right, so for example, we'll look at a very specific question type. It is a best evidence pair question. Now these are called this way because they usually ask, um, they ask a question and then they have evidence for that. So based on the passage in which situation would an individual stand blah, blah, predicting how she or she is perceived. Now we took this from a test and we didn't really put the passage there because there's no space. This is just to show you how it typically looks like. Now, what you should do for these is that you should first look at the best evidence questions answer choices. Now, this is the best evidence question because it says best evidence. So this is the best evidence question and that is the question that this one is based on. So what we recommend doing is that going back to the lines on these answer choices and looking at the evidence over there and seeing if that evidence supports any of these choices. So let's say, for example, um, I go, I read all the, I go back to all the passages and read the lines and I see in lines 41 to 44, they talk about how, let's see, a manager predicts the collective opinion. Yeah, so they talk about something like that. Then I'd know that the correct answer is this and that. Now, I don't know what the actual correct answer is, but that's beside the point. What you should do here is first look at the answer choices here, look at the evidence in them, and then select a question up here that supports them. No, that is supported by them. Yeah, so you choose the correct pair and then you move on. All right, so next we're gonna look at word choice questions. Now these are pretty simple. You basically plug the answer choices back into the passage to see if they make sense. So for example, here, that's the passage in which the word is, I underlined it and there is the question. So as used in line 72, impression most nearly means the first side substitute appearance in there. Despite its bareness, the appearance it gave was of austerity rather than poverty. Okay, that makes sense. The next one is belief. Despite its bareness, the belief it gave was of austerity rather than poverty. Now that doesn't sound correct because it can't, I mean, yeah, it can't give you a belief. So that just, just sounds wrong. And the next one is imitation. Despite its bareness, the imitation it gave was of austerity rather than poverty. That is also wrong. Like it won't make much sense. Recollection, that also doesn't make a lot of sense here. So just choose the best answer choice that makes the most sense once you plug it back in. Again, I'm able to do this because I took a lot of SAT practice tests and I know what the correct answer sounds like. Like I've developed that intuition. So taking multiple practice tests will also help you develop that intuition. And it will help you answer questions better. All right, let's look at some other question types. Now there are big picture questions, usually attempt these last, except if they're paragraph centric. So for example, what is the main idea of this passage? And that will usually be somewhere near the beginning of the questions asked on that passage. But you want to attempt this question last because then you will have answered all the other questions on the passage. And then you'll have a better understanding of the passage. So you can return to this question and answer it better. If it's paragraph centric, like what is the main idea of this paragraph, then you might wanna answer it there and then and there. There's also inference questions. Which, like, which of the following would the author most likely agree with? Now, what many students do in this type of question is that they would say, oh, now I am the author. What would I think if I was the author? That is the wrong thing to do. As I said before, this will always be stated in the passage explicitly somewhere. So for example, say, uh, a question is like, 
what is the author's view on electric vehicles? So then you would just think about what the author says and then what you would do is you would, you know, pretend you're the author and then say, oh, which of these would I choose? That's the wrong way to do it. In the passage, they will specifically explicitly state it somewhere. Like um, electric vehicles are good for many reasons. That is a line. And that line was written by the author. So now you know that the author thinks that electric vehicles are good. So then for that question, you could choose the answer choice that says he thinks that he or she thinks that electric vehicles are good. So it's always going to be stated in the passage. You do not need to pretend you're the author and then select the answer that you think the author would. It's always going to be stated in the passage somewhere. And other types of questions exist too, like graph questions are questions that ask for specific details stated in the passage. These are pretty straightforward and don't have any strategies as such. You can just, um, I guess, practice with these, but these don't really need much practice for many students and they're pretty straightforward. And again, some may not strictly fall into one category. They might be so all over the place that you can't classify them into one category. So then again, for such questions like this, practice makes you perfect. You get to practicing exposes you to these questions and that exposes you to better ways to solve them. It helps you understand them better and develop your own ways of solving them that are quicker and faster. Another note, if the question contains the word suggests, like for example, which lines suggest that electric vehicles are bad? Now cross out that word, cross out suggests, nothing suggests. The answer will always be stated in the text. Nothing will suggest something indirectly. They will always explicitly state it somewhere. So just be aware of that. All right, here's a bonus tip for the reading section. Doing as many questions as possible for the section is recommended, which is because it exposes you to a wider variety of questions because the reading passage usually has like a tremendous variety of questions, more than the writing or the math sections. It's very diverse. So doing as many questions as possible will help you encounter new question types and stuff like that, which will help you make your own new strategies for answering questions quicker. And then that will help you when you take the actual SAT, because if you find a question from that type, from a type that you already took by taking practice exams, then you will be able to answer that question better. So then again, doing as many questions as possible for this section is recommended like take a lot of practice tests or solve a lot of, I guess, reading sections, which will expose you to a wider, wider variety of questions, which will help you in the long run on your actual SAT. All right, so moving on to writing section tips. So this is what a typical writing section question looks like. You usually have this, you have your passage here, and then on the side, you have your questions. Now on the SAT reading passage, you usually have reading section, you usually have a passage, and then you have questions like after it. But on this one, you have, you have a passage on the left and you have questions simultaneously on the right. So this is what the typical writing section questions look like. They underline a word and they're like, oh, what should we do with this? Should there be no change? As in this will remain what it is. So a no change for question 34 would look like a practice at which. So you would not change that. And there are a bunch of options you can choose to change that. But there are also different types of questions, like uh, say questions that say, um, which of the following would, like the writer is hoping, the writer wants to add this sentence. Where would the writer add the sentence? And they're like numbers here, depicting which choice you wanna choose. So there are other questions too, but this is what the typical writing section question looks like. All right, so tips and strategies for the writing section. So you should brush up on grammar skills like fanboys before the test. I'm pretty sure fanboys is an acronym for all the conjunctions. Yeah, conjunctions. Uh, don't skip on, don't skip the parts of the passage that don't have any questions within them. Yeah, this is especially important because some questions, even though they may not like directly refer to a part of the writing section, like for example, uh, let's move back here. Yeah, so for example, if there is, if this is the page and say there was a paragraph which had no question right next to it or anything like that, a lot of students, what a lot of students will do is they'll skip reading that paragraph and then they'll move on to um, paragraphs that have questions beside them. That is the wrong thing to do because some questions may refer back to that paragraph 
or some questions may require that paragraph to like, some questions may be more reading style, reading um, section style, and they'll require you to have, you know, some comprehension of the entire passage as a whole, or some explicit parts of that passage to answer that question. So just don't do that. Don't like um, skip parts of the passage, don't have questions with them. No need to skim the passage. Yeah, so you should not skim the passage. As I said before, you may lose valuable information. This section requires you to um, read very closely on the, like if you just solve this, if you just attempt this passage, you will see that you'll have to read very closely to choose the correct answers. So don't skim it. If you skim it, you'll, you'll skip entire, you'll skip important details, which will um, lower your score on the test. So don't skim the passage. And read each answer option carefully. Two options may look similar, but they may have slight differences. That is also an important thing to do. Uh, can you please mute yourselves? All right, so as you can see in question number 35, these are pretty similar. Like, oh, uh, where'd, where'd it go? Yeah, 35. So the first option is no change, which is usefulness with the comma. This one is with an M dash. This one with, is with the semicolon. That is without anything. Now, these may look very similar. So you might just choose, they might be like, oh, they're similar. So just choose one and move on. But they're like tiny differences, like these, um, like these punctuation marks that change the meaning and make an answer correct or make an answer wrong. So you need to read every answer choice carefully and then decide which one to pick. Skip, yeah, you should skip questions that you find the most difficult. This advice generally applies to all passages, to all sections, I mean, because you want to be able to attempt all the questions on the SAT instead of like spending too much time on one and then having to skip a few at the end because you didn't have, didn't have enough time to attempt them. And the pacing should be around 30 seconds per question. It gives you time to check your work. Yeah, so an average, you have an average of 47 seconds per question, but going faster than that is strongly recommended to around like 30 seconds per question. All right, so first let's look at the first type of questions we're gonna to discuss today, which are the word in context questions for the writing section. Now these aren't too complicated, but you should review the SAT vocabulary list. Now what they used to do in past SATs is that there was this uh, huge list, this huge SAT vocab list, and they used to ask you for specific meanings of words on them. They don't do that now. They have more questions, they um, have more questions like these, in which you're not required to define a word, but rather pick the best word that fits that definition. But you should still like be familiar with a lot of words that may appear on the SAT, which are on the SAT vocabulary list. Yeah, so word choices are similar. To, yeah, so sometimes when the word choices are similar to each other, choose the one that sounds the most correct to you. In this case, there are many questions in which there will be four informal answer choices and then one formal answer choice. So for example, icky is very informal. Mm, yeah, so I'm assuming that the no change answer choice is also a formal one. So if usually the tone of most passages on the SAT writing section are formal. So you don't wanna choose informal words like icky. The essay, that answer will be considered wrong because it doesn't fit with the formal tone of the SAT writing passages. So you might wanna watch out for that. So you wouldn't choose D because it's just informal. The rest of these are formal. Absimil is formal, surly, I think that's formal, and no change, whatever that is, that may have also been formal. So then you'd have to choose the one that sounds uh, the most correct there. And lastly, don't be afraid to you choose the no change option. That could be right. Yeah, so don't be afraid to choose this just because it's the same on every single question. As in, usually a lot of questions have no change, three other options. Yeah, that's a lot of the questions on the writing section are like that. So don't be afraid to choose no change. Sometimes it is the correct answer. Sometimes it isn't. All right, let's move on to command of evidence questions. So these usually involve making a change to the passage. And the reason to make the change also needs to be correct in addition to the change. So for example, if you look at this question, this is what they typically look like. At this point, the writer is considering adding the following sentence, blah, 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 blah. Should the writer make the addition here? So this question usually has two parts. First, they have a yes, yes, or a no. And for that, you should usually read the passage first and then decide for yourself before looking at the answer choices, whether they should have it or not. 
Then you look at the reason, because it provides historical context, because it provides a useful reminder, because it unnecessarily repeats information from earlier. No, because it makes a claim about Sikira's work that is not supported by the passage. So if either of these is wrong on one answer choice, then the entire answer choice is wrong. What I mean by this is, for example, if the, ans if the addition should not be made here, then this answer choice is wrong because it says that it should be made here. If the thing does not provide historical context for changes discussed in the passage, then it shouldn't be here. So an answer choice, so even if an answer choice is wrong, for one of these two things, wrong for whether it should be there or wrong for the reason, the entire answer choice is wrong. So just remember that. And to be correct, both things need to be correct. Both the yes or no and the reason need to be correct. So just be aware of that. And if you're stuck on whether the phrase should be added or not, think about if the phrase is relevant to that part of the passage. Sometimes it's irrelevant, sometimes it's slightly relevant, but at the same time, not too relevant. Yeah, so you should think about if it is relevant to that specific part of the passage. All right, so hand it off to Karthik here. All right. Um, so then next we'll be talking about expression of ideas questions. So this is kind of similar to words in context, but instead of just dealing with one specific word, you're, you're like rearranging uh, entire paragraphs or uh, sentences. So as you can see here, I'm don't have the text with the don't have the text but it looks like there was like a specific sentence that you're you're required to rearrange and i get it's mainly testing you to see if you understand how to form clear and concise sentences that makes it easier for the reader of the article to understand so usually the less wordy and i guess the shorter answer would be the correct one i'm not saying that you immediately like choose that one automatically but you should probably be leaning towards uh, the more shorter ones. So like if I were to see this, this question on a test, I would probably be looking at towards A or B to, but to actually make the definite uh, answer choice, I would probably like uh, sound it out in my head. So like I would read it. Of course, you can't talk out loud because then they'll think you're cheating, but you would probably say in your head, just like read it, like to be labeled organic, a product, something like you read it like that. And if it makes sense, then that would probably be the answer choice you would choose. And you would also want to see if it makes sense in the broader context of that portion of the passage. So it's expression of ideas. Oh, no. Try say it next. Um, next is the standard English conventions question. So these are the more common, uh, this is the most common type of question in the writing section. And there, there's not even like a, a question line, but you automatically know that you have to apply some sort of grammar rule. So for example, like in 21, you have, there's, you have to know when to use the correct there, the one with the I or the one without I, or whether or not you should use are or is. And this just comes from your knowledge of grammar rules and what the, what the, passage is talking about at that specific uh, question point. Um, and then you probably need like other skills you'd probably need to know is verb tense. Uh, so like past, present, future, subject, verb, agreement. So it has to be like, if the subject is plural, then your verb also has to be plural. And then of course the tenses have to match. Parallel construction is like, if there's a list and all the items in the list are, or not, yeah, items or words in the list end with like I and G, then the list has to continue with, uh, then the continuing words also have to end with I and G. It's kind of like the same structure uh, going on. And then commas, like we talked about in the general uh, tips about the fanboys acronym. Uh, I don't know if you heard that, but that's how they teach us when to use commas and so like that's kind of a I guess that to knowing when to use uh, certain punctuation marks is also beneficial um, and yeah these come through like practice and memorization and then next will be uh, graph questions so the main uh, three thing main three things that they'll ask is what does the graph say so just reading is just reading what the graph is like for example um well, it's like that. What's the average daily high temperature uh, 
in like June and then there would be different and you would just look at the graph and just see the correct answer. And then does it agree with the passage? The question may point to you, paragraph two says this and does it make sense with the, with the graph? And then you would either say uh, yes and then you would give like a reason and then there'd be a reason why it would be correct. And then, and then in this case, it will be uh, how should the, oh, go back, <laughs> sorry. Uh, how should the passage be changed so that it agrees with the graph? So the picture that the picture shows that example. So like which choice most accurately eff effectively represents the information in the graph. So you would change what the because the you change what the passage says so that both the data in the graph and the text in the passage makes sense together. Okay, and then a bonus tip is that you should do a lot of practice. Um, on like a writing the on the writing section to know which questions would sound most correct and if we I know we kind of touched upon this earlier but it's like developing that intuition of knowing when you're looking at a list of a uh, list of answer options you knowing which one would make sense because of all the past experience of doing practice tests or practice problems uh, when you develop that it'll help very much when you're actually take, doing the real thing and with that we're moving on to the math section. So some general tips, so some general tips for the math section is that you should probably be focusing more when you're trying to review concepts, you should be more focusing more on your high school, like math. I don't know, I don't know, Aryan, what do you, what do you call like the, the courses like you take before uh, pre-calculus or AP Calc, but typically those sort of, uh, those sort of classes will be the topics from those will be on the test. So don't don't worry about pre-calculus or AP Calc because that's definitely not gonna show up on the actual SAT. Um, It'd be um, geometry, pre, uh, algebra one and algebra two. Oh yeah, something like that. So it, the, those make sure you study those classes. Don't study anything more than that because that'll just be wasting your time. Um, do practice problems from an SAT prep book or Khan Academy to see how problems are like. Um, yeah, so I guess develop like knowing how the format of the, knowing the format and the types of questions that we'll be going on later in the presentation. But I guess it's more important to be doing practice tests that have those uh, types of questions so that when you're going to take the real test, you're not going to be uh, surprise, you'll know what type, you'll know uh, what to respond when you're given a certain type of question. Uh, writing down work for problems. It's the work is not graded on the SAT, but they still give you a lot of space uh, to show your work. And that's sometimes beneficial if you're trying to keep track of what your uh, what your thought processes are. And if you want to check your work, you can easily see where you could have made a mistake in your uh, thought process when approaching a problem. And, you know, it's just avoiding silly mistakes because uh, silly mistakes that uh, you wouldn't probably, you would probably miss if you were doing everything in your head. Uh, when it comes to pacing, the calculator section would be, you'd probably have to spend 30 seconds per question on the no calculator question uh no calculator section you're probably spending one minute per question and then also just one important uh, uh one important note is that all diagrams unless stated otherwise are drawn to scale which we'll be going over uh, later on yeah i'd like to add something to this really quickly so as you guys may have remembered from the starting of the presentation i said there's about a minute and 20 ish seconds per every question on the calculator section. And you don't want to spend that much time on every question because a lot of the questions on the math calculator section are like some are easy, some are medium, and some are hard. So you don't want to spend the same time on every single question because then you might need that extra time on other questions. That is why the seconds, that is why the recommended pacing does not match up to the average time per question. And yeah, for that goes to drawn to scale thing, unless said otherwise. For that, you can just look at diagrams and then, you know, estimate whether angles are similar or not if they don't have the a line at the bottom that says that this diagram is not drawn to scale. If it doesn't have that line, then you can assume that all of them are drawn to scale because it says that on the test booklet. So then you can just estimate angles to be similar or the same. Yeah, you, 
you can you can bring like uh, extra tools like protractors or rulers so you're not you're not meant to actually be measuring them it's just i guess like what arnie was saying to estimate and i guess i would use it to like check my answer but we'll be going over that in a upcoming slide all right so then okay so we'll start with algebra questions so we gave we're, i think for this uh, math section what we're doing is just going to be talking about specific types of problems and we'll have some examples on the slide for you to see so this would kind of be like a typical algebra problem so you have an equation and you're asked to find what ax plus b is so i guess what this and i think i, I think this may be a theme for a lot of the sat math questions and we'll be seeing one later on but it's they'll try to get kind of it's not, i wouldn't say trick but it'll kind of make it seem like a super complicated question and that maybe like scares some students, but doing practice and slowing and uh, carefully reading the problem, there's actually a very simple solution to this. So for example, in this case, using uh, the distributive property, you can, remove, uh, you can remove the nine from the equation. So you have like nine times AX plus B equals uh, 27. Yeah, and then you also add the six to both sides you get 27. And then automatically you can see that AX plus B is three in this case. And so you choose A. So I guess it, this just goes to show how practice, number one, practice is very important because I'm sure if you do practice on from College Board, from Khan Academy or from some SAT prep book, you would see a question similar to this and you would know how to respond to it if you when you were taking the actual test. And also, I know we talk about pacing, we talk about um, uh, like sometimes going fast, but it also this is important. You don't rush and make sure that you're actually carefully reading the problems so that you can find the inefficient way. So efficient doesn't mean rushing. It just means getting the right answer quickly, but also correctly. Um, and then for systems of equations, uh, it's kind of like when they would give you two equations and like two linear equations, or sometimes it can be quad, uh, quadratic. Um, and they would ask you to find intersection points sometimes it can be word problem format or sometimes they'll just uh, explicitly give you the uh, equation you would either um, I know the, the size is to like subtract or add them up but basically I would just do whatever is easiest so sometimes uh, subtracting and adding equations to isolate variables would be the easiest other times I guess if you feel like if you feel like it, you can substitute it but I would say majority of the time, try to avoid substituting equations into each other. That just, uh, that increase that you're, wa you're wasting time because that's so much more work and it just leaves more room for error, which of course we want to avoid. So just adding or sub subtracting equations and multiplying, I'm not sure how you multiply, but uh, adding and subtracting equations to isolate variables, that's the easiest that would probably be the more easiest and more reliable way to solve these type of questions. Yes, yeah, so multiplying what I meant is multiplying each side of the question. Yeah, so for these type of questions. Oh, like that, and then you yeah. subtract. Okay, that makes exactly. sense. Okay. So for what I'm talking about is that there would be a equation like this and there would be another equation below it. It would have both A and B and then X too. And then you would just like, you know add those up add what's on the left side and then add what's up on the right side. And then you would manipulate them before adding them to like say, get rid of nine on both sides. So you'd have AX plus B and then maybe the six would cancel out or something like that. So that is what I meant. Yeah, and that's the, you're typically finding where both equations will like cross. So you have to find where they're equal to each other. Um, okay, and then next slide. Oh yeah, so continuing on algebra, in this case, uh, you would probably have to, it probably isn't like a definite way to like solve it. So most likely you're just probably in like this case, you're just gonna have to uh, test, test these option and to see if it's equivalent to the equation to the expression they give on top. So like in this case, you can plug in one and zero into each answer option and to the expression given to see which ones are equivalent to each other. I would say this is this is also an example of a question that you might want to skip because of course uh, this is a time consuming uh, question and there are probably a lot more easier questions that are going to come later on in the section. So marking this and uh, skipping the question 
were probably more beneficial because you finish all the easier ones and you come back to this with the extra time you have and go through the time consuming process of plugging in numbers and seeing uh, which ones match. Of course, if you think this is really easy, then go for it and uh, do this. Uh, uh, you, if you can do it quickly and correctly, which is very important, uh, then go for uh, completing this question uh, immediately. But for those who may find this process time consuming, just come back to it after, uh, after you finish everything else. Um, okay. Also, it's recommended to like, you know, just substitute this with zero if no important terms are getting cut out. Yeah. This... You want, yeah, substitute zero. For example, if you plug in zero here, this simplifies to negative three halves. And if you plug in zero everywhere else, it's pretty quick. And you can see that this is negative three halves. So this is the answer. So you just do quick stuff like that. Oh, well, yeah. Well, I mean, sometimes it can be more complicated. But yeah, if you just, whenever you're coming with the uh, hard problems, you'd probably just want to skip it. Okay. And then next slide. All right. Data analysis question. So this is, uh, I know we talked about graphs before, but now there's more math related. So in this case, you're probably paying attention to the prompt and it's a lot of times students will miss key info. So for example, I know it also says in the graph, but the y-axis is not like a, a specific distance, but it's a rate. So keeping that in mind will help you uh, help you answer, correctly answer the, uh, the following questions. And typically sometimes, uh, there may be more than one question for a graph. So like maybe two or sometimes three. Or, yeah, that's, that can also happen. So we're getting, a, and they may be connected to each other. So getting a misunderstanding of the graph can result in many questions, losing many questions. Um, you may also want to brush up on uh, the different types of graphs and charts, even the more obscure ones like uh, box and whisker if that brings up any uh, memories from like elementary school, because that, those may show up on the, on the test and you wouldn't want to be confused about how, what the graph is representing. And then knowing statistical terms like uh, sample size and error and like how to build a good study. So sometimes the question may ask, like, if you want to know like how many uh, people are part of the band program in your school how would you uh how would you build where would you go and ask people to uh have a good study so you would probably want the your answer would probably typically be a, a place where you can ask people randomly so it's not just one specific group and it's probably a, a large pop a sample size because large sample size always give you more accurate data um and then error you would probably want to know the, I don't know if you've seen the plus or minus symbol that's showing like the error bounds and confidence levels showing like how confident uh, the person or the group doing the study is about their error. So knowing that that sort of stuff will can tell you what the most accurate answer is. So just brushing up on those sort of terms. And then next slide. Okay, advanced math questions. This is uh, another example of a uh, trick question. It's not where like it's kind of it seems like it's a difficult uh, problem if you're uh, if you're a student taking an unprepared student taking this test. But if you look at it carefully, uh, you can see. I don't know if I should. Uh, I can reveal the answer. So yeah, in this case, you can see there's an x squared, and if you know the property that squaring a negative number will become positive then you can see that the G of uh, plugging in four and plugging in negative four should be yielding the same answer. So in the, they give you the answer in the question. So automatically, no, it's eight. And yeah, you could probably do some uh, sort of um, substitution, but what this, but that's not the most efficient way of solving this problem. And you just end up losing time when you could be spending more time doing more harder problems or checking your work. And yeah, this tip is not specific to just advanced math questions, questions like uh, questions like these, where they kind of uh, put it under a guise of like a, a super hard question when it's actually really easy, can be show up uh, around around the section it can be any type of problem. So just make sure you're doing practice and looking at uh, problems carefully will um, 
will help you um, understand, will help you um, have more, take, do the more efficient path when solving problems and saving time. Okay. And then geometry questions. So back to the, what we were discussing before, if unless stated otherwise, um, the scale, the graphs and the diagram shown will be all up to scale. So that means like if you were to take a protractor and put it on the graph, it would show the correct angle. Of course, as mentioned before, you're not allowed to bring, uh, you're not allowed to bring protractors or rulers to uh, measure angles or sides. So the mainly the reason, uh, main, main purpose of knowing uh, if it's to scale is to see if your answer is correct. It's like, for example, is not to uh, give a good estimation and see if your answer is somewhere around that estimation. So for example, if your answer was, uh, you had an angle and it got to, and your answer was 132 degrees, but then on the graph, it shows that on the diagram, it shows that it's an acute angle, meaning it's lower, it's less than 90 degrees. Then you probably did something wrong. and should check your work. I know that's like, that's the best example I can come up with it, but uh, essentially that's like, it's just to do quick checks and see if your answer is correct beyond uh, checking your actual math and seeing if your calculations are correct. Um, but yeah, and uh, you, you should always assume it, but make sure you read the, read the problem carefully because if it says it's not to scale, then yeah, in this case, if it's not to scale, if it says it's not drawn to scale, then make, don't, don't use what the strategy I said earlier, because then you may get it wrong. Don't go by the diagram. Okay. And then next slide. All right, some bonus tips is, yeah, getting used to the question types and develop and practice strategies to solve questions that are most efficient and require the least time. So trying to figure out, yeah, which, uh, which methods are easier and uh, lead to less time wasted. Of course, we're not telling you to rush through the uh, problems. Efficiency and rushing are not the same if, because rushing will, will most likely lead you to wrong answers while efficiency will is still fast, but it'll still give you get the correct answer. And the only way to avoid rushing and being efficient is by doing a lot of these practice problems. And then another the other tip is don't always use a calculator on the math uh, calc on the calculator section. So yeah, sometimes punching in the numbers and using like a graphing calculator, it give you the correct answer, but you're probably using it, if you're using it for such simple uh, computations that you could easily do on paper or in your head, then you're probably just wasting time when you could be uh, using your graphing calculator for more harder uh, and more time consuming questions. So calculators and calculator section does not automatically mean you have to use it for every single question, just for some of them. And you should only use it when absolutely necessary. Well, not absolutely, but when it's, uh, when it's, when you can't do it in your head or can't uh, write it fast enough. And I guess you could, and if you have extra time, you probably just come back to those questions when you're checking and use your calculator when you check the questions, but not when you're probably, uh, not when you're doing it firsthand. Um, and then next slide. All right, so now we're talking about tips on prep materials. So it's recommended you only use material and questions from the College Board itself or Khan Academy, or we can also mention like prep books you can find in um, uh, bookstores, um, but make sure like they're reputable sources because yeah, some third-party questions may not be of the type and style found on the SAT. And that's important because as we mentioned multiple times throughout the session, uh, knowing the format and knowing the types of questions that show up on the SAT will allow you to build these efficient, uh, efficient methods of an answering test questions so that you are not wasting time and you're getting the correct answer. Doing, uh, doing a different format or learning like different types of questions that are still the same concepts, but different types, which are kind of different, uh, will not serve you well when you're actually taking the test. So that's in the next slide. That on the Khan Academy is, <clears throat> has officially partnered with the College Board. Yeah. So their questions are going to be of the exact style and type you'll find on the SAT. And yeah, it's also completely free. So 
it's a, I used it a lot and it was very helpful in doing the doing a lot of practice problems. And they also do for the English and the writing and reading sections. So the whole test is covered. Um, and then, yeah, practice. So practice, we, we keep talking about this and we'll probably keep talking about it because it is probably the most best way to study for this test. Yes, reviewing concepts and uh, ideas is important, but that alone probably won't really help you because you're not familiar with the types of questions. You're not doing active practice and not seeing where you can improve. Yeah, that's an important part. You just don't, that's another, also another important part. You just don't take practice tests and just grade it and move on to the next one. Take the time to see which questions you got wrong and which uh, concepts you need more help on. And I know Khan Academy does a great job of that. When you get a question wrong, it kind of connects that to a certain skill that like there are certain, there are skills that College Board is testing you on in the SAT. And Khan Academy will connect a, a question you get wrong to a skill that, uh, to a College Board skill, and will probably um, advise you to do more practice on that skill. So uh, doing more, uh, practicing the questions you get wrong is super important, not just uh, doing practice, just doing uh, practice, just practicing a lot of tests. Um, and then also, I know Aryan mentioned this earlier on in the session, but don't burn yourself out. Doing three to four practice tests a week is probably not very helpful and probably means that you're not really checking the questions that you're getting wrong. So you're just, just rushing through and rushing is bad, right? So you're just rushing through all these practice tests. Make sure you're giving yourself time to giving yourself breaks. Well, not too much when you're just uh, slacking off, but you're giving yourself time to like rejuvenate between tests and to uh, carefully look through which uh, questions and which question types you're getting wrong. And yeah, if you're burning yourself out, then you're just tiring yourself and your scores won't really improve. 